You are listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair on RLM Radio. The girl of your dreams has got to be in some bar. Sorry, boys and girls, but this is X-rated. So if you're under 18... Get out, get out, get the point. Good. And now... Bend Y'all ready for this? We do it all night long. And now, your host, Grammy. Hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody, and happy Freaker Friday over here on RealLibertyMedia.com, Channel 10. You are listening to Grammy Mary, and it is soggy again out here. My God, this is the High Plains. We're supposed to be, like, almost desert-like out here. I mean, it usually is pretty dry. But, yeah, the last week and a half, we have gotten as much rain as I think we've gotten the whole rest of the year. Holy smokes, Batman, it's soggy. I'm going to turn pruny. Well, I'm going to say I'm going to turn pruny. But I'm I'm checking out stuff over here on what? Do they, is Ted Cruz already running for Popo? <laughs> I just saw a meme a little bit ago that said that... Uh, the Zodiac Killer wanted to step forward and say that, no, he is not Ted Cruz. Quit accusing him of that. <laughs> I do think Ted Cruz is Grandpa Munster reincarnated, though. I really, honestly, and truly do. Um, oh, crap. My daughter just posted on Facebook. So why do people take the time to order food at a drive through and then take off? Two people in front of her just did that. Good Lord. Apparently, they did not have McNuggets, although she doesn't do Mickey D's. She doesn't like Mickey D's. I think she prefers Burger King or uh, Sonic, but, eh, yeah. Oh, well, over here on Fakey Book, that's pretty much all the excitement I've seen over here today, although I haven't really been paying attention because I've been busy. I've been busy, busy, busy. But, um, yeah, I... I uh, haven't been paying much attention to anything on the interwebs today, if you want to know the honest truth. So, I'm going to be winging it again. I know this is a shocker, but over here on Fakey Book, not a whole heck of a lot going on, except for I'm seeing people sharing this video of uh, the granny reading to her wee bairn about uh, the wonky donkey. <laughs> And I love that video. Oh, my God. I know there is no way in heaven or in heck that I would be able to make it through that video or make it through that whole book without having to stop and run to the bathroom because I'd pee myself if I didn't. <laughs> it's hilarious as hell. If you haven't seen it, I'll have to find it again and share it again. But, oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's pretty much all that's going on over here on Fakey Book. On, um, let's see. We're Twitter. Twitter. I got another stalker. Yay! And, yeah, Ted Cruz and the shit about Nike and and um, Julian Assange and Trumple Stilskin. And, basically, see you, love you, bye. I'm pretty much bored with it. And I haven't even been looking at it all that long. On Mines, let's see, what's going on on Mines? Mines, I did not share, if Barman put it on there, I did not share that, yeah, I'm live, but, eh. Hey, everybody over on Mines, if any of you are listening in today, ooh, somebody's making a big old honk and barbecue with fish and lobster tail and steak and onion rings and big... Polska kielbasa and ribs. Oh my god, my tummy's rumbling already. I've got a ham going in the oven right now, so it's all good. Um, other than that, not a whole heck of a lot going on. Well, yeah, they're sharing. Ooh, they lied for centuries. Yes, I know this. I know this. True pyramid's purpose has finally been discovered. Uh, um, hmm. I don't know if they've actually discovered that or not. Just because, you know, they've been trying to hide it so well. How do we know that this isn't just controlled opposition? Mm. 
guess I'll have to check that out later because it's a YouTube video. Okay, so, Fakey Book, Minds, Twitter, Freedoms Network. Hey, all you effing people. Thank you, Grimmy, for sharing it over there on uh, that effing site. I truly do appreciate it. Um, Mjuter Suits. Sweets. Is that who you are? Hello, dear. A new person over here on this effing site. How awesome is that? And uh, Java, 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 Java Doctor was over here as well as Bob Renner too. So hey there, everybody. I hope you're having an awesome Friday evening. Um, over here on the reallibertyorg Once again, thank you, Barman, for sharing over there. I really do appreciate it, hon. You are the bomb. The bomb, as in truth bombs, just boom, drop them on you. Don't care if there's any collateral damage. Basically, the collateral damage is that, oh my God, you might have to deal with your uh, little Stockholm Syndrome stuff. Or become a critical thinker. Hey, how wonderful is that? Now, to get to the place where you need to be, if you want to give me static over here in the reallibertymedia.com chat room... If you are listening in on Spreaker, I can't chit-chat on Spreaker. It's too many windows to have open or too many things going um, with my crappy little internet. So, <laughs> come on over to reallibertymedia.com. Think of a nickname. Click on the link there, channel 10. Think of a nickname. Join the chat. Give me static. It's all good. It's all good. Let me see. Eric Dillard, the sun is not what you have been told. Oh, I think I've seen that one, Goober. I think I have. Or Eric Dollard, that's what it is. Um, put a bell on it. Ding a ling a ling a ling. My ding a ling. My, I'm going to have to find that song now. I may have to play that next Wednesday. I do have that in my repertoire. Okay, so over here in the RLM, right up top, I see Barman, the most splendiferous bot in the whole wide world, closely followed by Grimner, who is the RLM god, don't you know? And you know what? Grimmy's warmer than I am. Damn, Grimmy's hotness. <laughs> I also see the lovely Moose Girl is here, and guess what? Moosey and Grimmy will be on later this evening for the Freaker's Ball, so be sure to come and check that out. It's always a good time had by all. I also see the lovely Kate is here. Hey, Kate. Kate truly appreciated the little donkey book, too. Yeah, it was lots of giggles. Lots of giggles. And bless her heart, that Grammy, she's having a heck of a time getting through that book. And yeah, she's wheezing. I was wheezing right along with her. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, in any case, Phantom. Oh, Hiccup. Hi, Phantom. How you doing? Phantom's the one that did my intro for me, and he is awesome. I also see Anti is here. Hey, Anti, as well as Asmo, the lovely Beth Z. Got a little bit of Chloe going on. Actually, a double dip in a Chloe going on. Also have Chalcedonian here and Colfax 101. Yeah, that street out there in Denver where you can get just about anything. Cyborg Noodle, the bot that touches you with his noodly goodness, is here. As well as D underscore C, Dakota. Donald Trump is here. Hey, Popo. How you doing, Potus? It's the Donald Trumple Stillskin. Dude, love the comb over. I also see... <laughs> I also see Frumpy is here. Hey, Frumpy. And Gooberzilla is sharing some way cool. You know, I probably ought to click on that link so I don't lose it. I think I have seen that one before. I think, I think, I think. I think, therefore, I am. Stop. Don't start. Don't start. Don't. Shit. <laughs> Oops. Okay. Now that I've clicked it, it will show in my history. So... I can go back to saying hi. Okay, uh, Frumpy Goober, me, I'm here, as well as Gromit. Hi, Gromit. You're apparently something on a bong. I always knew you as something on, you know, like those little eyelet thingies on shoes. Um, I be Don C is here, as well as Java, 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 Java Doctor 2. How are you doing? Oh, handmade back then. Sweet. Awesome. Thank you, Goob. 
let's see, Java Doctor, JJ's, that JJ's feller liked something I posted over on Twitter. I have very few people that like things that, or even acknowledge. I mean, I got Barman, and I got JJ's, and Vinny, and Gary L. That's pretty much the extent of it. Unless I, you know, share something from someone else. I, I, I have stalkers, and yet they leave me alone, which is really kind of cool. I also see Juan Taco is here. Thank you, by the way, JJ's, for sharing that. I really do appreciate it. Kozu is in the house. Hey, Kozu. Layer 8 is here, as well as Meister Briar. Hey, Woody. How you doing, hon? I got a story for you, hon. I'm going to do first thing, just simply because... Thank you, Rob Works just fired up the bubbler and passed it around. Puff, puff, pass. I feel so Elon Musky. <laughs> Ew, that's just wrong. He does not impress me at all. Sorry. Actually, no, I'm not sorry, but what the hell. Hello, Rascal, are you going to help me? Rascal has decided she's going to get on my lap and help me. Moy, 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 moy is here, as well as a couple of doses of the pox in the chat. We got a pox box and a poxified going on. I also see pom 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 sauce, the lovely rain, who is falling from the sky. Thank you, rain. Moisture is wonderful, but yeah, you keep this up, honey, and I'm going to have to get a swather out to mow. And I mowed just before the rain hit. So, yeah. Makes everything like weeds grow. Not the fun kind of weeds either. RLM Fluky is here. The Vanna White of the RLM channel. As well as Rob Works. Who is just so awesome at firing up that bubbler and passing it around. I also see Sock Puppet. Hi Sock. How you doing? Hope you're having an awesome time. Skittle. Skittle is the f bombinator bot of the chat. And... I'm, I think I know what triggers Skittle, but I'm not going to say it out loud because if I do, then everybody's going to be triggered, and we don't want a, a triggered Skittle. Really. Skittles. Skittles. And to round out the crew, the one, the only, the trust, no one. So hey there, hi there, ho there, everybody. I hope you're having an absolutely splendiferous Freaker Friday evening. Now let's get, wow, 15 minutes. That's not too bad. Um, my puppies are crying. They want to come in, but they have a tendency to bark, 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 bark when uh, I'm on the radio, and that's kind of that's kind of difficult to snuffles as being such a big baby. Okay, um, rascal, chill, girlfriend. You do not chew on mommy's microphone. Okay, so first thing I want to get to, this is from druglibrary.org. Hmm. I had to have a sip of coffee. Yes. Only, this is the second pot today. You should be proud of me. Yesterday I had through, or not yesterday, Wednesday, I went through three pots. <laughs> and you could tell by the way I was broadcasting, couldn't you? Whee! I was caffeinated. So, from www.druglibrary.org. The History of Marijuana Gateway Myth. Hey, did you know hemp was George Washington's primary crop and a secondary crop for Thomas Jefferson? So hemp has been around in America for a long time without apparently causing much destruction in society either. Each sailing ship carried several tons of hemp in its rope and sails so cultivation of hemp was a major industry. Even though cannabis was widely grown, there were no allegations that it led to harder drugs. But in 1910, they believed that the certain stepping stone to opiate addiction was eating Mexicanized food. <laughs> So that's what does it. So when I go and order a burrito deluxe or a taco or a sancho or a run, whatever I go, chorizos. Ooh, I like chorizos too. Um, if I go order Mexican food, that's a gateway drug. Wow, that doesn't surprise me one bit. Okay, apparently the fundamental idea comes from America's puritanical history. 
And it is the idea that pleasure is sinful. Yeah, you shouldn't be having fun. No fun. You're not supposed to be enjoying this reality. It's supposed to be a torture. And you know, that mindset is pretty much what allowed the leeches that be to gain so much control over everything because you're not supposed to enjoy yourself in this life in this reality you're not supposed to realize that you you my dear are the universe experiencing itself through your unique perspective no you're not supposed to know that kind of stuff you're supposed to slave away and trudge along and barely eke by and for God's sake, don't have fun because God doesn't want you having fun. Yeah, puritanical what? Yeah, also, you know, apparently small pleasures led to cravings for larger pleasures. <laughs> okay, I can testify to that. <laughs> I say amen. Or maybe since it's Friday, ramen. Since it is Pastafarian Holy Day, may you be touched by his noodly goodness. In this example, those who crave spicy foods will inevitably crave larger pleasures, such as opium. I have never craved opium. Or if I have... I just didn't realize I was craving opium, and instead, I satisfied it with a Butterfinger. Because <laughs> Butterfinger is its own food group, you know. Now, apparently in 1920s, some states outlawed mechihuana because of the belief that heroin addiction would lead to the use of marijuana. Which is just the opposite of the modern myth. So, if, if you're doing heroin... And then you decide that, oh, that's just not cutting it. You need a joint. Wow, that's an interesting twist on things. Apparently, cannabis has been widely known and used in many, many medicinal compounds for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. So there's ample evidence in the 1930s to show that... Um, to know whether there is a connection between mechihuana and harder drugs. Now, in 1937, Henry, or Harry Anslinger, who is the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, testified before Congress that there was no connection at all between marijuana and heroin. The reason marijuana had to be outlawed, he said, was because it caused insanity, criminality, and death. All in that order, apparently. Because if you had death and then criminality and then insanity, it just doesn't work right. Apparently, it has to be in that other order. Now, one example he gave was of two young lovers who became so crazed after smoking a joint that they eloped and got married. Egad! And gadzooks! Ode de humanities! How, ah, uh, how just absolutely diabolical of that plant. Now, the other reasons that he gave were no more sensible. Apparently, the hemp industry representatives who testified were uniformly surprised and mystified to hear that a dangerous drug could be made from this widespread and common crop. And the American Medical Association testified that they knew of no evidence that marijuana was a dangerous drug. Mmm, now... You know, times they be a-changin'. The U.S. government encouraged farmers to grow hemp during World War II because it was vital to the country's war effort. National security, don't you know? Yeah. Only when the government needs something do they want you to grow it. But they want you to sell it to them at a price that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Harry what? How's that pronounced? Harry Aslicker. Oh, thank you, Grimner. I, I'll have to... <laughs> oh, how funny. That's a good one, Rob Works. Apparently, Rob Works will submit to the taco. <laughs> Resistance is futile. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I cannot resist. I'm. I. I have to. If there's some. Hmm. Now I'm hungry. Okay. So. To carry on, in 1944, the LaGuardia Committee report on marijuana with a H, not a J, confirmed Mr. Aslinger's statement. And there was no connection at all between marijuana and heroin. Then in 1951, good old Harry Aslinger was testifying about why we needed tougher drug laws. Just before he testified, the head of the Federal Addiction Research Program testified that they knew for certain that all of the reasons that had been given for outlawing marijuana in 1937 were entirely bogus. But, you know, Harry Aslinger, um, or is it Aslicker, Harry Aslicker, was he not, where is that at, Federal Bureau of Narcotics. So, in other words, he was trying to keep himself in a job. Job security, if you need job security and there just ain't anything out there to prove that your job is necessary, make something up. Apparently, <clears throat> they knew for certain that marijuana did not cause insanity, criminality, and death. And Aslicker, thank you, Grimmy, uh, was left with no reason for tougher laws, so he made up on the spot, with not a shred of evidence, the assertion that marijuana is the stepping stone to heroin addiction. Because there's something about rolling a joint and token that makes you want to put something in a spoon and heat it up and then inject it into your veins. Yeah, I can see that correlation. Not. Eh. Wrong answer, Harry Aslicker. <laughs> I like that. Thank you, Grim. <laughs> Apparently, he directly contradicted his own testimony from 1937, and it has been the basis of U.S. Mechuana policy ever since. Because, well, you know, if you're going to make up a Whopper, make it a hell of a Whopper, by golly. And I'm not talking Blega King. So, since that time, the federal drug enforcement officials have tried to support this myth with the idea that most heroin addicts started with Mechuana. And statistics which seem to show that marijuana users are more likely to have used cocaine. Now, the first assertion would get a failing grade in any freshman logic class. The second can be explained by the fact that people who engage in one risk-taking behavior are likely to engage in other risk-taking behaviors. And it, too would earn a failing grade in freshman logic class. Well, it would have in the 70s. Maybe not so much anymore. In 1970, the Canadian government did their largest study ever on the subject and found no connection between marijuana and heroin. In 1972, the U.S. government did their largest study ever on the subject and found no connection between marijuana and heroin. Now, let me see. I'm looking here. I think they have two letters in common. That's three letters in common. Wow. Ooh, that's half of the letters in heroin. So, obviously. Yeah. Now, this was also the conclusion of the largest study ever done by Consumer Union published the same year. So... The real reason that hemp is illegal is nothing less than lunacy. Mechuana, including industrial hemp, was originally outlawed because all Mexicans are crazy and marijuana is what makes them crazy. Or at least that's from Dr. James C. Munch, who's a ass muncher, the uh, U.S. official expert on marijuana with an H from 1938 to 1962 and testified in court under oath that marijuana had turned him into a bat. <laughs> I'm thinking he had li lingering bat in the belfry tendencies prior to, is what I'm thinking. Now, Dr. Buttmunch also supported the testimony of one murder, one murder defendant who claimed insanity because he had been in the same room with a bag of marijuana. O-M-G. <laughs> Ha, 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 ha. 
that bag of marijuana made him go kill, kill, kill. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the defendant was acquitted by reason of marijuana-induced insanity. Holy shit. So, every major study of marijuana policy in the last 100 years has found that marijuana prohibition is a mistake, which does more harm than good. And yet, and yet, we still have this war on drugs, which basically the only reason it is still ongoing is because it's a money maker for those that are perpetuating the war on drugs. That's the only reason. Das Klicker. Okay. <laughs> and yeah, Rob, I'm thinking just about everybody started with beer as well. And I was not much of a, you know, I, I tried, first time I tried beer, it was like, ack, ack. I stepped right up to the hard stuff right off the bat Seagram 7 <laughs> and why did I switch to that because my brother bought it and I could get some from him <laughs> and then I went on to the marijuana thing and stepped away from the Seagram 7 because marijuana didn't make me puke the next morning so of course then I went into the vodka and gin and <sighs> I've, I've sampled quite a few different things in my day. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Although I've never done heroin. I've never done coke. Um, I have done white crosses once in my life. And never again. Because man, that messed with my... I got such a wonky metabolism slash system anyway. That yeah, those white crosses, that was bad juju. Never again. So, <clears throat> thank God. Uh, get this posted over here on Real Liberty. Oh, wow, it is to laugh. Even though it's not very funny. Okay, and put it over here on this effing site, because, yeah, Grimmy's got way cool emoticons, and I know you were going to play with that over on, on realliberty.org, Grimmy, but I have a funny feeling that, that that site probably does not support some of the coolest emoticons over here, which really sucks, but I will survive. Yes, I will. Oh, man, I scrolled way too far down. I just wanted the puff puff pass dude. Because, yeah, I'm being a gateway Grammy. <laughs> oi. Oi. Did I put that over here? I don't think... It, yeah, I did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. All you damn marijuana demons partaking of the devil's lettuce. See how you are. You're going to hell. Hell, I tell you. And the good thing about going down there is you won't ever have to look for your bit because there's plenty of fires to light that doobie with. So, moving along. Go back to my pocket because I'm not real sure what else I stuck in there. I stuck all kind of cool stuff in there, but I'm not real sure what because <laughs> I did it the other day. And, yeah. Um... Okay, where do I... Yes, we're going to go here. This is from chipsahospital.org. And I hope it's not... Okay. There's a video attached to it, but this is also from... Um, it's an exclusive and beat cancer with no chemo or radiation. And here are her nine tips from a 25-year-old stage 4 breast cancer survivor. They do have a video attached. Now, Anne E. Fondva and her... Well, hello, and how are you? I sp Oh, God, that guy looks like Elon Musk. We can't have that shit. No, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want that. Um, I need to turn the volume down on there now 
Um, it's from her Annie Appleseed project. But Anne received treatment back in 1995 from Chipsa Hospital and was, has since devoted her life's work to help others find their healing path. Yes. Oh, you just didn't get to it. <laughs> I know, Grim, those shiny things, they get me every time. They really do. Hmm. Yeah. I think shiny things are a gateway something. <laughs> mischief. They are a gateway to mischief. That's what they are. Okay. So, to say she's inspiring is an understatement. She founded Annie Appleseed Project, which is a 501c3 nonprofit corporation which provides information, education, advocacy, and awareness for people with cancer and their families and friends who are interested in complementary or alternative medicine and natural therapies from the patient's perspective. They also have a link to her Facebook page here. So, Annie's nine tips to you, um, to your success. Number one, food matters. This is the number one thing that Annie pointed out. Number two, eat organic whenever possible. No preservatives, artificial colors, and bring your own food when going to restaurants with loved ones. And you know what? I processed four gallon bags of organic zucchini today. So yeah, I'm going to be doing a lot of eating organic. Number three, enjoy life. Don't let the fear of cancer overwhelm you and focus on simple things. Birds at the park or the breeze by the lake to unwind. Yeah, mm-hmm. Go out and enjoy nature. Number four, be physically active. Walk around when you can. The body was designed to move around. Number five, no, I don't need to consult with a doctor today. Stop it. I got pop-ups from this page for some stupid reason. Every, all the other pop-ups are blocked, but this one, no. Damn it. Um, number five, stay positive and share that positivity in group settings. Smiling is contagious. Number six, if you're going to Chipsa, go to the classes. The lectures and educational pieces are crucial. Number seven, go with your gut feeling. Believe you can and will heal. The power of the mind cannot be overstated. Number eight, detox. And still does coffee enemas 25 years later, which, okay, I like my coffee, but I want my coffee coming in the other way. Just saying. <laughs> Number nine, stay strong or stay committed strong and make it possible. Many have done it before you and it's now your turn. So there's a lot of good information in her interview. So take a few minutes to watch it. And yeah. Um. And they have another one about Laura, who was blind in her left eye when she came to Chipsa Hospital. And now she can see. So this apparently is their testimonial page. Because if you keep scrolling, you'll start seeing all kinds of way cool testimonials. So, yeah. Step away from the chemo and radiation. Those things are poison and cancer causing. Mother Nature has what will fix what ails you. You just have to understand and use it properly and encourage your body to heal. That's a big thing. You have to encourage your body. And you also need to talk nicely to your inner warrior. Because whenever you talk down about yourself, your inner warrior listens and it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So stop doing that to yourselves. You're awesome sauce. You may be irritating from time to time, but you're still awesome sauce. So. Oh, shit. <laughs> I have my fingers on the wrong buttons. 
Okay, get that posted and put it on the effing site because it's just freaking awesome. And then there was something else that I saw earlier and I don't remember if it was a video or if it was something that I saved to my... Hmm... Apparently it was not something that I saved to my pocket because I'm not seeing it now. Damn it. See? Shiny things. And then I go all off on a tangent. And then next thing you know, it's like, what the hell? I remember seeing. I remember. A little bit. And now it's gone. So. Props to Annie. For doing and not falling in for the fear. That's. That's a lot of it. Because, man, there's an awful lot of people that try and bully you into being afraid. And you're going to die. And you know what? We all are anyway. That is one of the rules in this reality, in this physical reality, is everyone's meat suit expires at one time or another. You may as well just deal with it. It's going to happen to us all. Even the leeches that be eventually kick that bucket. Excuse me, I need to drink coffee. So, okay, where, where, where are you to not, anybody remember that song? Hmm? Let's see. Okay, I'm going to go with this one, just because it looks kind of cool, and it's from wired.com. Um, from last week, actually, to heal wounds, cells time travel back to a fetal state. Huh. So, an embryo starts out as just a single cell. It's not long before it divides into two cells, then four, then eight, and so on. And the process, marked by rapid growth, in which these early unspecialized cells proliferate wildly to start building all of the tissue of the body. So as development proce uh, proceeds, these embryotic and later fetal stem cells become more specialized, differentiating into precursors of various cell lineages, which in turn give rise to more mature cells, like blood cells, nerve cells, muscle cells, intestinal cells, Major functional changes in these tissues continue to take place after birth as the organism adapts to life outside the uterus and for the first time using its lungs to breathe air and its digestive system to process food. Now a few cell populations retain some of that early plasticity as adult stem cells helping both to maintain tissue on a day-to-day -day basis and to heal wounds. Now, in recent years, moreover, it's become clear that those aren't the only cells that stay flexible. Sometimes when the repair process calls for it, more specialized cells can take a few steps back or differentiate to re-enter a stem-like state too. So... Now, newer results suggest that that plasticity may e go even deeper than scientists have thought. Here we go. Science. Yeah. At least they said thought instead of belived. Now, three research teams have observed that during tissue regeneration, the typical solutions um, offered by adult stem cells and the differentiated cells resembling them aren't enough. Instead, the cells of the damaged tissue turn the clock back all the way to a more fetal state. Tapping into the prolif proliferative power that once characterized development and a program thought to have long gone silent. So, in the early 1900s, scientists theorized that the specific blood cell types, their... Um, they'd learn to distinguish from one another underneath a microscope. Red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. 
and from that came a common, more primitive source, a stem cell. But it wouldn't be until the 1950s and 60s that researchers could offer definitive proof of their existence and begin to delineate their unique properties. The discovery of the first stem cells came about indirectly from the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945. By the way, thanks Uggle Sugar for that one. And I'm sure those people in Japan are ever so thankful as well. You know, it was one of those, what does not kill me makes me stronger. Yeah, Japan ain't nearly as stupid as we are. At least when it comes to the vaccine thing. Now... Um, back to this. So, medical workers observed that exposure to radiation caused a precipitous drop in the survivor's white blood cell count. And experiments in mice showed that bone marrow transplants could offset those losses. Now, work over the following decades gradually revealed why. A population of cells in the marrow could both self-renew and differentiate into various more specialized blood cell lineages. And these were the blood making stem cells. <coughs> Excuse me. They departed from the behavior of more specialized cells in several key ways. When a differentiated cell divided, it produced two copies of itself. And depending on the cell type, the number of times it could do so was limited. Now that wasn't the case with the stem cells isolated from the bone marrow. When they divided, they did so over extremely long periods of time and in a process known as proliferation. Moreover, those divisions were asymmetric. Each stem cell produced not only a copy of itself but also a daughter cell fated to become a specific type of blood cell. Now for those daughter cells, it gained a differentiated identity and there was generally no going back. So as stem cells or as stem cell populations were later found in other organs as well, that paradigm served as a template to interpret, yeah, interpret experimental observations on other mammalian tissue. Hans Cleavers, a molecular geneticist at the Hubricht Institute in the Netherlands and one of the world's top experts on stem cells wrote in 2015 that, um, oh, he wrote that in 2015, never mind. <clears throat> but it wasn't necessarily a good thing because attempts to fit observations on solid tissue into the blood stem cell hierarchy mold Cleavers continued, have led to confusing theories, terminologies, experimental approaches, and heated debates, many of which remain unresolved. Basically, it's one of those things where I have a hockey stick and therefore global warming. You try and take whatever information you have and you force feed it into a mold, making that square finding a round solution doesn't work. You need to take all of the information and quit trying to make it fit in. Now the plasticity of everything is that um, by the time Cleavers penned those words, the concept of what it meant to be a stem cell was already undergoing a massive overhaul. In the late 1990s, stem cells from human embryos were isolated and cultured for the first time. In other words, say, keeping the placenta in the hospital so that they would have something to experiment on. Oh, and all of those aborted fetuses. Wow, look at all of that stuff. It's a plethora of material to experiment on. Pay no attention to the fact that you had to kill a baby to do it. That wasn't viable anyway. No, not at the time you did it, it wasn't, asshole. In any case, <clears throat> so they took these stem cells from human embryos 
isolated them and cultured for the first time in the 1990s, revealing that unlike adult stem cells, which could give rise to only cell types found in their tissue of the organ, a blood stem cell in a bone marrow might regen or might generate a neutrophil, whatever that is, for instance, but wouldn't differentiate into a nerve cell in the brain. But embryonic stem cells harbored the potential to become any cell type in the body. Are you now starting to see? It's a multiple level thing. You know, I mean, Margaret Sanger started it because she wanted to eliminate the black race. Her words. And uh, she thought this would be a way. And yeah, they convinced the pastors and all that fun stuff for the for your own benefit. You should not be having all of these babies. So why don't you just go and it gave them all kinds of stuff to not only experiment on, but I'll bet you dollars to dog turds that they're making money on multiple levels from that as well. So no wonder it's no wonder Planned Parenthood is still in existence. Besides the fact that people are just freaking selfish idiots. Yes, I said that out loud. Now, meanwhile, adult stem cell tissue, uh, adult stem cells found in tissues other than bone marrow didn't always seem to act similarly in the blood stem cells. Ones discovered in the intestine characterized through the 1990s and 2000s indicated that certain stem cell populations could replicate far more vigorously than those residing in the bone marrow and could sometimes divide symmetrically. Several organs, including the pancreas and kidney, didn't seem to have populations of cells that functioned exclusively as stem cells at all, implying that other cells in those tissues might have to assume stem-like duties in certain cases. In Cleaver's words, the search for stem cells as a physical entity may need to be replaced by the search for stem cell function. Now, the real turning point in uh, demonstrating clear evidence of such plasticity came in 2006, when Shinya Yamanaka and Kazu Kazutoshi Takahashi of the Kyoto Indi University in Japan took connective tissue cells from adult mice and by introducing just four genes to them succeeded in essentially wiping the slate clean and transforming them into embryonic like stem cells. It eventually won uh, Yamanaka a Nobel Prize which uh, big whoop they give the Nobel Peace Prize to Dangleberry. So, yeah, that prize has been tarnished beyond repair in my books. Now, scientists rapidly followed up with investigations into whether this might be occurring naturally, too. And it certainly seemed to happen in the formation of tumors. Cancers have stem cells, as well as differentiated cells driven by mutations to a more stem-like state. But could such a process also represent something ordered, something healthy? I hear you, Snuffles. Now, the answer turned out to be yes. Throngs of cell types throughout the body, in the skin, in the lung, in the stomach, can be de-differentiated when exposed to an injury that causes inflammation and damage to normal stem cells. While cells that have differentiated more recently are particularly prone to regaining their stem cell origin in these situations, researchers also begin to show that cells even further down the specialization path can go back. So see, your body has the ability to heal itself. That's the basic breakdown of this. Your body has the ability to do it. You just need to give it the proper incentive. Now this week, or last week actually, a group of researchers led by Ricardo Fonde, 
who is a geneticist at the Erasmus University Medical Center in the Netherlands, reported that one such cell type, the paneth cells in the intestine, which secrete molecules that control the gut's bacteria composition and digestive health, loses its normal gene expression patterns in favor of stem-like ones after injuries. These cells do not normally divide at all, but once they're coaxed into the stem-like state, they proliferate rapidly like stem cells, giving rise both to copies of themselves and to more differentiated cells. Similar results have been demonstrated with other cell lineages as well, and some labs are even trying to capture cells in the act of de-differentiating. Our cells are much more plastic, much more capable of responding to injury than we ever thought. So much so, added Simon Bukzaki, who is a cancer researcher at the University of Cambridge, that what everyone is saying at the moment is that everything is plastic. Everything can become a stem-like self if it's pushed. <coughs> So, <coughs> excuse me, but what did that transition look like at the more molecular level exactly, particularly given how complex the concept of stem cell has turned out to be? So what did the stem-like state of a de-differentiated cell really entail? Well, a few recent papers, one published in 2016 and two others within the last year, provide that many researchers considered to be compelling evidence that at least some differentiated cells can transiently express a developmental gene program that rewinds not just back to an adult stem cell state, but all the way back to a state similar to that of the developing fetal organ. So in retrospect, the findings might not come as too much of a surprise. Researchers who studied salamanders and other amphibians, the paradigms for tissue regeneration, see this happening on a far grander scale all the time. Those organisms can regrow entire limbs, bone, muscle, cartilage, and all by recapitulating a developmental program from a bud-like structure that forms on the injury. But humans and most animals aren't capable of this kind of tissue regeneration. And at most, scientists have hypothesized that the de-differentiation process implicated in both tissue regeneration and cancer involves the activation of some sort of embryonic and developmental pathway. But studies of embryonic gene activity in such cells that could support that conjecture have had mixed results. It's an attractive idea, said Andrew McMahon, a stem cell researcher who studies the kidney at the University of Southern California, but frankly, the evidence for that just isn't there. So part of what is significant about the new findings in is that they suggest researchers studying regeneration in humans and other animals might have, might have been looking for the wrong signs. Rather than embryonic genes, perhaps they should be searching for the fetal markers that emerge a little later in development. Now that's not what Richard Loxley and Ofram Klein, who are researchers at the University of California, San Francisco, initially set out to do. Loxley, who's an immunologist seeking to gain a better understanding of allergies in the immune system, wanted to track the role of stem cells and what they played in the intestine's response to damage from parasitic worms. We quickly saw that the whole thing goes sideways, sideways Loxley said. He'd expected stem cells located close to where the worms had burrowed into the tissue to become more active, generating new lineages and making the necessary repairs. Instead, the genetic markers used to identify those stem cells disappeared entirely. Yet even with that population depleted, 
the cells around the wounds began dividing more rapidly than usual. It suggested that maybe the cells had shifted into a new injury responsive state. That came from Yesbrand Nuss, who is the author of the Nature paper that the team published in June about the findings. It would take years for them to figure out what was controlling that shift. But Loxley started collaborating with Klein, his UCSF colleague, and a stem cell biologist. The unanticipated result had piqued his interest, and they found that a particular immune response was activated, <coughs> and that the gene SCA1 was being expressed at high levels in the damaged tissue. When cultivated in a dish, those SCA1 cells formed blobs of tissue that looked more fetal than adult. A connection made possibly only a few years earlier when scientists first started describing the development of fetal intestine in molecular terms. Now Klein and Loxley's team found that a slew of other genes expressed during the development that had been transiently reactivated. The same cellular reprogramming occurred after irradiation and other kinds of injuries. And in response to various types of damage related to inflammation, then the cells seem to be invoking some kind of fetal memory, though the researchers are careful to point out that this doesn't represent a complete return to the fully fetal state. It does imply that adult cells can reactivate the same pathways that are normally used during the patterning of the tissue in the first place. So that was from Kelly Yan, who is a gastroenterologist at the Columbia University Irving Medical Center in New York, and she was not involved in the study. But two other research groups have uncovered a very similar phenomenon. In 2016, a team led by Marie Isabel Garcia, who is a biochemist at the Universe, Université Libre de Bruxelles, whatever, yeah, in Belgium. She published work in the development showing that injured stomach tissue in mice re-expressed a protein marker identified previously as a progenitor cell from the fetal stomach. Now, more recently, researchers led by Kim Jensen, who is a molecular biologist at the University of Copenhagen, further found that um, support for their process in the colon of mice with inflamed bowels. Not only did the regenerating tissue express the SCA1 marker and other signatures of the fetal program, but Jensen and her colleagues also implemented a potential mechanism. They reported in stem cells, or in cell stem cell last December that mechanical forces from the extracellular matrix surrounding and supporting the cells activated a signaling pathway that initiated the repair. Now the matrix stiffened, something Jensen is now hoping to show, is also ind indicative of a fetal state. So these results point to this being a generalized process where there's been an inflammatory or lesion-like injury. And it's like a security system that the body has left in place since its developmental period. Once again, in simple words, the body can repair itself. It has the equipment to do so. You just need to give it the proper fuel. Now, <clears throat> it makes sense, according to Loxley, given how the system most likely functions, fetal systems very quickly build real estate. You just want to lay out the organ, where the streets go, the conduits of electricity, the plumbing, and in repair, too, the name of the game would be about quickly amplifying the number of cells and making them as flexible and mobile as possible. All that matters is patching up the breach to the tissue. So it's like throwing asphalt on top of a hole, according to Loxley. 
positing that it's the most energetically efficient way to repair damage. Whether in the myocardium, after a heart attack, or in the skin after a major burn. So if there's a way to access an already less costly way to, re to cover the real estate, then who cares if you make a heart using fetal heart cells? You need it rebuilt first and can, and can let it differentiate later. So see, once again, I'll bet you they're making money off of this shit like with heart transplants and all that other fun stuff off of aborted fetuses and and the um, um, afterbirth and the placenta and all of that from when mothers give birth in hospitals. I wonder if maybe that's part of the rise in C-sections as well so that they can take all of that out, scoop it all out and not lose any of the goodies. Uh, see, tinfoil hat, getting a little snug again. Now, back to this article. So, it happens again and again in biology, Nuss said, and certain principles get used over and over and over again in different contexts. So it would make sense that to repair the tissue, you'd use the same pathways and patterns that were used to initially build that tissue. Amphibians quite clearly do that. Now it seems that something sort of like that in a primitive way is happening in the intestines of mammals too. Unfortunately, experts posit that cancer, which is basically a disease of chronic inflammation, can develop when something goes awry during this regenerative process. And that's when the something's go, that's going awry. I put forth that possibly something is going awry because of all of the nasty crap in the food we're eating. We're not feeding our bodies the proper fuel. We are putting poison in there. And so when the body goes about... The, it, all of its little helper stem cells going to try and repair whatever damage was done. We're putting poison in there, which is morphing those into more cancer cells. That's what I put forth. I'm not a doctor, though, so I'm not sure. So, when mature cells revert back to long-lived proliferative state, like that of the fetal cells their opportunities to acquire mutations increase. Perhaps one or more of those mutations might eventually cause the cells to get stuck in their more fetal repair mode, preventing them from differentiating back to their specialized entities and leading to the out-of-control proliferation characteristics of tumors. Now, there is some support for that theory. Cancer risk increases in patients with inflammatory bowel disease and certain types of physical trauma. Now, other experts who've been studying cells throughout the body capable of de-differentiating during regeneration or cancer can return to their data, and this time with the express goal of uncovering whether a more fetal state was invoked to facilitate the process. I don't think they've looked for fetal markers. No, they wouldn't because chemo is just entirely too profitable as well as radiation. <clears throat> so, but I bet that those markers are there. That's from Jason Mills, who's a biologist at Washington University in St. Louis. I don't think anybody's made the connection yet. In fact, Mills is one of the leaders of the recent effort to cement that connection, and he's working to bring together experts on regeneration and cancer in different organs in the hopes of digging deeper into the potentially con um, conserved mechanism underlying the de-differentiation process. And he's planning the first conference on the topic, which will meet in Colorado in January. Huh. Maybe doing a little bit of puff, puff, pass while you're there too, dude. Mm -hmm. So, the further back you go toward an embryonic state, 
the more cell, the cells start to look alike. So we could find global markers of regeneration or cancer by examining this process. And uh, Mills likens it to other conserved cellular processes like mitosis, which is cellular division, and apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. In the same spirit, he and his colleagues coined the word for de-differentiation de -differentiation events in tissue repair and cancer, which is paleogenesis, or a return to a generative state. And a paper that was published in February in the EMBO journal, for instance, his team outlined how cells can revert to a more primitive, rapidly dividing state through what seems to be a conserved sequence of pathways. Gastric chief cells in the stomach and mature ancillary cells in the pancreas, which both perform a secretory, as in secretion, I'm assuming, secretory functions in their respective tissues, they undergo similar changes in response to injury. They lose the same markers, express similar genes, and become smaller and more similar to embryonic cells. In both cases, the cells first degrade the features that characterize their differentiation then reallocate their energy to support replication rather than secreting behavior. Now these cells have also been implicated as cells of origin in stomach and pancreatic tumors, which is consistent with the idea that cancer may be the result of paleogenesis gone wrong. In other words, all of the crap you're eating. Your body's trying to fix itself, but when you feed it all that poison, it goes wonky. That's my medical term. <laughs> now, Mills and others have identified a few of the genes and pathways involved, but there's still much more work to be done. Until now, Mills said that he's been, or has mostly been focused on the cell biology and the structural and signaling mechanisms in each cell not the fetal side of things. So as he and his colleagues seek a more fully characterize the process of paleogenesis, um, they work like that with work done like uh, Loxley and Klein, it can guide them toward new places to look. There's still a long way to go towards cementing these ideas Klein, Loxley, Jensen, and Garcia, for instance, need to figure out what triggered the fetal-like response that they observed in their various experiments, which once they figured that out, there is your cure for cancer, although that will not get out to the general public because chemo and radiation. That's my, there, that's my freaker's ball prediction for next year, Grim. <laughs> so early in the year. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Okay, and they observed these in various experiments, and whether it comes from the specific cell type or all types, they'll figure out how it's related to those instigating cells that are to the original stem cells that got suppressed. Garcia is particularly interested in what happens after these events how the redifferentiation phase of regeneration works. And they also have to find out how all of these work in humans, not mice, and definitively test the functional necessity of the reversion. It makes sense that it's um, to cover a region with cells as quickly and efficiently as possible, but the researchers need to prove it. After that, it should become possible to distill the mechanisms employed throughout the process and perhaps eventually exploit them for growing better tissues in the lab and learning ways to prompt healing after the onset of an injury or disease. <coughs> Excuse me. It's something to add to the toolbox in which you can promote repair or prevent that damage from occurring in the first place. So, <coughs> Excuse me.
as a physician and scientist, that's what interests ha um, Jan. Now, I think instead of going for using this to eventually exploit them for growing better tissues in the lab, I think what they need to do is get it figured out and then teach people what they need to do nutritionally and mentally and physically to repair themselves. But damn it, that cuts out all of that profit margin in big pharma and the medical industry. So I'm not real sure that this is ever going to be, ever, going to be one of those things. You know, it's not going to be something that, that the um, medical industry is going to put out there, I don't think, for quite a few years, simply because they're still making too damn much money off of the whole treating the symptoms as opposed to fixing the dis-ease. So, let me get this shared over here on the RLO, realliberty.org site, which by the way, if you have not joined realliberty.org, come on over and join. It really is pretty cool, and it's um, gaining members like crazy which I think is pretty freaking awesome. I don't know that we want to gain too fast because, yeah, that has a tendency to cause real problems. But it looks like we got 53 members so far, so. Yes. I know that was very long and very very detailed, but wow, it's also very vital. And it it feels right. It sounds right. It reverberates or, or it vibrates right, you know? It's one of those things where your body can fix itself if it knows how. And uh, that's probably part of the reason why they're keeping people so dumbed down and why they're poisoning the food and why they're poisoning the air and poisoning the water. And I keep saying they and that they is, that they is like a colloquial thing. It's like we are part of they in that instance because we don't vote with that money that's currently king in this reality or at least this society. And we don't say, you know what? You're doing things that's polluting my food, polluting my water, polluting my air. So my money is not going to go to you. And that's how you get these people is you hit them in the pocketbook and you hit them hard. I've noticed a lot of different, they're, of course, they're, it's a bunch of bullshit and it's starting to really piss me off. But you hear all of these, you see all these labels anymore that are, um, it's, um, organic or non-GMO or no high fructose corn syrup, which I like seeing that on there. I see that on the label and then I go back and I read the ingredients. I don't trust those bastards, but yeah, you're starting, they're starting to put that stuff. That's why you don't need a law to tell them to do that because the companies know if they want to increase the money that's coming in, their profit margin, they're going to put that information out there because people are starting to look for it. And they know that. They also know that if they don't straighten up their act, hey, Bo Diddy, I see you over here on the effing site. If they don't straighten up, you know, these corporations, they also know, or if they don't get more sneaky about it, they know that they're going to start losing money because people are going to go, mm, mm, I don't trust y'all. I'm going to go with this guy that stipulates everything that's in it. You know, and I want them to start letting me know what those natural, those anonymous natural ingredients are. Natural flavoring. I want them to stipulate what that is. Because if it's got something to do with an organ by a beaver's butt, I, <laughs> I don't want to go there. Just saying. So... Awesome, awesome, awesome stuff out there. But don't hold your breath about it getting to uh, 
the general public as a treatment option. You're just going to have to heal yourself. Physician, heal thyself. Y'all are physicians because y'all know your body better than a doctor. And that's, that's one of those things that it's just, just in the last few years, it's really, really clicked home for me. You know, you feel like crap. And instead of going, man, I feel like crap. And I know this makes me feel better. And that makes me feel better. But I'm going to go to someone else because they've got that magic white coat and that magic little thing that they put in their ears. And then it's really freaking cold. They put it on my chest and put it on my back and they listen to me breathe in my heart. And then they tell me, yeah, you got what you said you've got. And then I shell out 75 bucks for that. Really? Which is why I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Ugh. They get you coming and going. Most definitely. And I just, I stay away from them as much as possible. I see Bo Diddy over here on this realliberty.org. Hey, Bo, good to see you. I hope you're having an awesome Friday. Let's see. I've shared that on the effing site at, there and yeah hiccups gosh darn it i need to stop hiccuping hiccup now let's see one more and then i think i'll go check out the pig how about i go to this one this one because it's magic fuck you see i haven't done the f-bomb yet tonight so i needed to do that This is from theguardian.com um, from September 1st of this year. And it's Philip Pullman, Why We Believe in Magic. Because it's magic, fuck you. You know, the world of magic defines rational explanation, or it defies rational explanation. But beware dismissing it as nonsense, because like religious experience and poetry, it is a crucial aspect of human being or of being human. So that is from the author of Dark Materials, which is Philip Pullman. Now, <clears throat> a new exhibition of the Ashmolean or at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford brings together a multitude of objects and artworks and there's a puppet or a rag doll with a stiletto stuck through its face an amulet containing a human heart a wisp of ectoplasm apparently extruded by a medium in Wales and too many others to count from a dark world of nonsense and superstition that we ought to have outgrown a long time ago. Well, at least that's how I imagine rationality would view it. I find myself in an awkward position rationality-wise because my name is listed on the website of the Rationalist Association as a supporter. And at the same time, I think this exhibition is full of illuminating things and the mental world is illustrated or or the mental world it illustrates is an important one. No, it's an essential part of the life we live. So, I better try to work it out what I mean. I'll start with William James in his book The Varieties of Religious Experience in 1902. James takes an interesting approach to his subject. He's not trying to persuade us of the truth of this religion or that, or to unpack some complexities of dogma, or to interpret religious stories for the new 20th century. The book is about what the title says, Religious Experience, what it feels like to be converted or to lose one's faith or to be in a state of mystical ecstasy, or to exis of existential doubt. James's examples are drawn from the testimonies of believers and unbelievers alike, and the question of whether there is a God, and whether Jesus Christ is his Son, and so forth, 
is of little interest to James's main inquiry. Only the effects of believing it matter here. For example, we may doubt that Virgin Mary actually, in fact, physically appeared to Bernadette um, at Lourdes, and we may doubt that there ever was a Virgin Mary in the first place. But the vision, or whatever it was, was clearly profoundly meaningful to Bernadette, and her account of it was meaningful to many others, and it certainly had an effect on her and the life she led. And of course, she's not alone. Countless thousands of thoughtful and intelligent people have had experiences of a kind that they call religious. James paid them the compliment of taking these experiences seriously and produced a classic of psychological insight. But could there be a varieties of magical experience? Could the mental universe that produced witch bottles and sigils and grim, uh, grimoires, not grimners, grimoires, and the whole idea of magic itself be rich enough to sustain an examination of that sort? Well, the universe of magic is a large place, and it contains phenomena ranging from simple good luck charms to complicated systems of be life and practice such as astrology and alchemy. And it comes to us from prehistory and from every part of the world. And it still flourishes today. The variety of ideas and objects it contains is almost limitless. The one thing they have in common is that rationalism would scoff at all of them as absurd, outdated, meaningless superstitions that aren't worth wasting time on. But rationalism doesn't make the magical universe go away. Possibly because I earn my living as a writer of fiction, and possibly because it's just the sensible thing to do. I like to pay attention to everything I come across, including things that ev evoke the uncanny or the mysterious. Homo sum, humani nihil, uh, what? Ami alumnum puto, okay, which is, I am human, I consider nothing human alien to me. Ah, well, I should have just read that instead of the Latin thing because I butchered the Latin. <laughs> so, my attitude to magical things is very much like that attributed to the greatest physicist, Niall, uh, Niles Bohr. Asked about the horseshoe that used to hang over the door of his laboratory, he claimed to have said that he didn't believe it worked, but he'd been told that it worked whether he believed in it or not. So when it comes to belief in lucky charms or rings engraved with the names of angels or talismans with magic squares, it's impossible to defend it and absurd to attack it on rational grounds because it's not the kind of material on which reason operates. Reason is the wrong tool. Trying to understand superstition rationally is like trying to pick up something made of wood by using a magnet. I have plenty of superstitions, which are my own and no one else's. I don't believe that anyone else would feel more able to write a novel, for example, if they used the only kind of pen and paper that works for me. But one of the interesting things about Spellbound the Ashmolean ex exhibition is that it illustrates beliefs that many people in many places and during many centuries have held in common. Belief in witches, for one thing, is more or less worldwide. In Christian countries, it reached a pitch of hysterical panic between the 15th and late 18th centuries at that time when tensions between Protestants and Catholic powers were at their highest.
and when the medieval world of faith was being challenged by new thinking of enlightenment. Among other things, it was a sy systematic exercise of cruelty and horror. During this period, writes Malcolm Gilskin, or Gaskin, excuse me, in the exhibition catalog, there were around 10,000 trials for witchcraft in continental Europe, the British Isles, and North American colonies. Now, unlike many human failings, this was not entirely the result of stupidity. Many intelligent people believed that witchcraft existed and that it was right and proper to stamp it out by killing those who practiced it. Nor is that cast of mind safely buried in the past. Till quite recently, people known to be intelligent have felt it was acceptable to put their names to arguments like if we really thought that there were people going about who had sold themselves to the devil and received supernatural powers from him in return and were using these powers to kill their neighbors or drive them mad or bring bad weather, surely we would all agree that if anyone deserved the death penalty, then these filthy quislings did. That was from C.S. Lewis in A Mere Christianity in 1952. So whether witches are filthy quislings or harmless village healers, they and those who believed in witchcraft and magic existed in a shared mental framework of hidden influences and meanings, of significances and correspondences, whether angelic, diabolic, or natural. Everything in the exhibition testifies to a near universal belief in the existence of an invisible imaginary world that could affect human life and be affected in turn by those who knew how to do it. And so do millions of other objects in similar kinds collected, exhibited, studied, or uncollected, unknown, lost throughout the world and every period of history. As do legends and ghost stories and folk tales. If anything is a permanent fact of human nature, this is. I find it endlessly fascinating. And I call that world imaginary, not to disparage or belittle it. Imagination is one of the highest faculties, and wherever it appears, however it bodes forth, the forms of things unknown, um, I want to treat it with respect. At its most intense, it becomes a kind of perception, as in William Blake's notion of twofold vision by which he means what we see when we look not with, but through the eye. The state of mind in which we can see a world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wildflower. Other poets describe something similar in Wordsworth's Ode to Imitations of Immortality from Recollections of Early Childhood. He recalls a time when meadow, grove, and stream, the earth and every common sight, to me did seem a paralleled in celestial light, the glory and the freshness of a dream. There was also Thomas uh, Trahern's vision of Orient and immortal wheat. In the everyday corn, comes from the same apprehension. So, <clears throat> I'm relying on poetry to make this point because I think that poetry itself is a kind of enchantment, which, yeah, it is. The effect that certain lines and images can have on us can't be explained <clears throat> Excuse me, by translating them into simple modern English. The very form is part of the meaning. And the sound the poem makes works like a spell on our senses and not only on our minds. But it's not just true of poetry. Everything that touches human life is surrounded 
by a penumbra of associations, memories, echoes, and correspondences that extend far into the unknown. In this way of seeing things, the world is full of tenuous filaments of meaning, and the very worst way of trying to see these shadowy existences is to shine a light on them. This shadow world, the state that Keats called negative capability, that is when a man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irrefutable reach or irritable reaching after fact and reason. This is where the imagination is at. And so are ghosts and dreams <clears throat> and gods and devils and witches. Their possibilities are unlimited and nothing is forbidden. But we have to be clear about what our imagination is. What it isn't is just a fanciful way of telling a story that isn't true or a pretty decoration that we apply to something else to make it attractive and that isn't fundamentally important. I have a high regard for the scientific writing of Richard Dawkins but I think that sometimes he expresses a view of imagin or a view of the imagination that I simply can't agree with. We don't have to invent wildly implausible stories. We have the joy and excitement of real scientific investigation and discovery to keep our imaginations in line. So, if we have to keep our imaginations in line, it's because we don't trust them not to be misbehave. What's more, only scientific investigation can disclose what's real. I beg to differ on that. Now, on the contrary, I'd rather say that there are times when we have to keep our reason in line. I dare say that the state of negative capability where imagination rules is in fact where a good deal of scientific discovery begins. In the old expression, reason is a good servant but a bad master, and its powers are limited, no work of art was ever reasoned into existence. David Hume was right. Reason is and should be the slave of the passions, not their governor. Or as William James put it, in the metaphysical and religious sphere, articulate reasons are cogent, cogent for us only when our inarticulate feelings of reality have already been impressed in favor of the same conclusion. The important thing is to be aware of both. Imagination can give us an empathic understanding of the world of magic. Reason reminds us that the cast of mind that persecuted witches is still alive. The Home Office's hostile environment policy appeals to the same dark instinct. The varieties of magical experience still has to be written, as far as I know, and it will only be done successfully by someone who engages the subject with both reason and imagination. Spellbound would be a very good place to start. So, wonderful. I like that one. And I do believe in magic, and I believe in fairies, and I believe in all kinds of things. Just because the vast majority of people can't or won't or don't see something does not mean it's not real. Can you see frequencies? Can you see sound tones? Can you hear a rainbow? There's lots of things that most people can't do, and yet I've I've seen videos of uh, th uh, there's a gal that is uh, deaf that paints, and uh, she feels the tones, and then she expresses it in painting.
what she what she feels the imagery that those the feeling of those tones puts in her mind's eye and then she expresses it on paper on canvas and it's amazing amazing work that she does who am I to say that she isn't feeling that I can't say that because I'm not her so who's to say that there aren't fairies who's to say that there aren't imps who's to say that there aren't trolls hell the internet's got a shitload of trolls so just because everyone can't see it doesn't mean it ain't there so now that I've done with that, I need to go and check out the pig. See what happened this date in history. Because it's magic. And those boys are, wow, there are times when it's like, wah, you guys are presto strangeo. But that's okay. I love them anyway. Okay. Oh, and by the way, the one I, the person I was talking to the uh, talking about the other day when I kind of went off on my tangent, Jordan Maxwell. I was listening to several of his videos throughout over a several day period, and uh, Jordan Maxwell is who I was, and that was the name that I couldn't think of. And it's like, damn it, damn it, damn it. Well, there it was, there it was. So he's quite fascinating to listen to. And he's, he can be quite insulting when he wants to be, too. And it's pretty funny. I sit there and giggle every, every time he says, get alive. Wake up. It's like, dude, seriously, you're fun. So, oh, I got to check out their pick of the day. Pig's pick of the day. Um, hmm. Okay. Eh, it's not as fun as I thought it would be, but eh, that's okay. I'll still share it over here in the chit chat. So, the word of the day over on PIGazette.com is social justice. Yay, social justice. The excuse popped, uh, popped out by a professional athletes who disrespect the flag of a nation which is so oppressive that they became multimillionaires for playing a game. Okay, well, you know, honey, it really is rather difficult to disrespect an inanimate object unless you honestly and truly believe that it is a magic sky cloth. How do you disrespect an inanimate object? That's my question of the day. In the quotable quotes section, Boy, our system has been thoroughly corrupted by this progressive status theology or ideology. Um, it's just unbelievable. That's from Mark Levine. The reporters are the mouthpieces for it, and they're the mouthpieces for progressivism. Wow, you think, Mark? Yeah, think? Okay, scrolling on down to this date in history. Wow, they have several. Yay, boys, you're overachievers here. I needed a sip. Okay, so this date in history, the 7th of September, 1876, James Younger Gang gets butts kicked while trying to rob Northfield, New, um, Minnesota Bank. Oopsie. This date in history, the 7th of September, 1936, a rock pioneer named Buddy, that'll be the day Holly is born. This date in history, the 7th of September, 1943, Greg Pappy Boyington takes command of the Black Sheep Squadron, goes on to make one of the best fighting outfits in the Pacific. This date in history, the 7th of September, 1963, NFL dedicates its Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. And finally, this date in history, the 7th of September, 1970, a dude with nothing better to do 
Donald Boyles perpetuates biggest parachute jump from bridge, 1,053 feet from the Royal Gorge Bridge in Colorado. Why jump off a perfectly good bridge? That's what I would have to say. Just like why jump out of a perfectly good airplane? I don't like heights. Just tell you right now. Not real crazy about them. So, that was This Date in History brought to you by Porcus and Hambo over here on PIGazette.com. Thank you once again, guys, for that. I really appreciate being able to go there. And I, I do have to admit that I think sometimes it's Hambo's wife that looks that stuff up. Because I'm friends with her over on Facebook, and she always comes up with some really cool stuff. So, um, let me see this one. Okay, this one is uh, from Forbes.com. Now, I'm going to read it in uh, my pocket because Forbes has a nasty habit of not letting me finish reading sometimes so and then once I'm done then I will click on the link and and share it around and y'all can deal with them but we've been lied to our whole lives about motivation so here's the cold hard truth so it's written by Jack Kelly so, we've been lied to our whole lives about motivation. Television and movies, where we derive most of our knowledge and education about life, personifies motivation in the form of the gruff, surly coach who shouts words of encouragement to his team. The sweaty, pudgy, middle-aged high school coach exalts his kids to bounce back from the beating that they were getting earlier on in the game. After a rousing speech, the music swells and reaches a crescendo, and the kids' eyes widen and they slowly start to smile. Slow claps begin and gain strength. The team leaders high-five each other. Everyone, including the towel boy, jumps up and down, and then they all charge back onto the field to win the big game and become hometown heroes. Now, the motivational speech always seems to work wonders in the movies, like the Bad News Bears, Rocky, Rudy, Hoosers, Remember the Titans, Invincible, Chariots of Fire, Field of Dreams, Sea Biscuit, Cool Runnings, okay, I like Cool Runnings, The Blind Side, We Are Marshall, Bill Durham, or Bull Durham, Breaking Away, Bend It Like Beckman, Cool Running, you said that twice. Uh, the Mighty Ducks, Happy Gilmore, and Dodgeball. I've only seen a few of those. Wow. And in real life, it's not so much. The strongly question, or I strongly question if this movie reality is really the way to go. To me, this type of motivation is like a sugar high. It offers, <clears throat> excuse me, an immediate boost only to burn out shortly thereafter. Now, there's an entire industry of self-help gurus, such as Tony Robbins, that write books and offer expensive seminars and programs designed to help you become motivated and successful. These products and services tend to help the guru gurus earn fast fortunes for themselves, and we hardly ever see the attendees on the cover of ha uh, Forbes or the Wall Street Journal. So, when it comes to looking for a job or embarking upon a new project, it is socially acceptable to tell people that you are waiting to get inspired and motivation. Your friends and family will nod their heads in agreement and, yes, you need to get motivated to start, they say. Well, I call BS on the whole motivational thing. You can wait forever and never feel motivated. You could feel motivated today, do some work, email a few resumes, and then stop tomorrow because the motivational feeling flitted away. 
probably because you saw something shiny and got distracted, like I do. So my advice is to forget about being motivated. Try something different and more realistic. Oh, God. First we had magic. Now we got realism. So set your goal. Outline a plan of how you can achieve the goal and then execute it. Yeah, it's that simple. Well, it's not really so simple. You know, it kind of requires you to constantly grind away at doing the hard, dirty work to reach your goals. This calls for you to work when you're tired, sick, hungover, not in the mood, having a bad day, or just want to sit and watch a sports movie. It is unglamorous and tedious to plot away day in and day out. But that is the reality of how to succeed. It doesn't make it or it doesn't make for good TV or movies watching someone going through all that boring daily tasks needed to get to the next level of their goals. There are no crowds cheering you on as you do paperwork. <sighs> That's sad. I'm now I'm bummer dude. Now I feel like Marvin the 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 uh, bummed out robot from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> yeah, apparently it's just you pushing yourself every day all the time. Son of a bitch. Apparently that's the secret. There's no one moment when motivation hits you and everything falls into place. Actually, I beg to differ. I have moments occasionally where I have the whole Acme light bulb thing go on. And then I get like super motivated and then I accomplish all kind of stuff. It may not last really long because I'll see something shiny or wear out, but it does happen. So apparently it's the thousands of hours of doing mundane, boring tasks that slowly and methodically get you one step closer to succeeding. It also depends on how you level success. To me, today... I level success by knowing that I got all of my zucchini processed, four gallons worth. I got my house cleaned and dusted and dusted and vacuumed all in one day. I'm impressed. Well, I finished the vacuuming and dusting, but yeah, I'm impressed. I'm like super overachiever. To me, that's a success story. Because seriously, dusting, I hate to dust. I hate to dust. So, to carry on with this. For example, when you're seeking out a new job, if you plan to wait for the right moment to feel motivated, you will never start and consequently remain stuck in the same old dead-end position. The trick is to take the first step, whether you feel motivated or not. Spruce up your resume, update your LinkedIn profile, then take the next step of searching for jobs online and send out your resume. I see, yes, Grammy, oh, from B. Yes, it is. And that's true, Frumpy. Life is simple, like physics, nothing in, nothing out. So, back to this. Okay, so after that, call a couple of recruiters and set up meetings. You know, you're talking big city shit here, okay? Just saying. Booneyville, that don't work so well. Seek out colleagues, former co-workers, mentors, and others who can turn you on to new opportunities. Read about which companies are hiring and which ones are downsizing. Keep adding new steps every day. And when you feel tired, run down, weak, and beaten up by life, don't give up and hide in your bed or under the covers waiting for some divine intervention of motivation to strike. Toughen yourself. Get out of bed and push forward. Even if every fiber of your being is telling you to quit, this is what they don't tell you in the costly seminars and Hollywood version of life. You have to keep striving. 
even though mentally and emotionally you don't want to. It is an ironic contradiction and paradox. It will feel as if you're not going against or you are going against the tide and you are. You will have to get used to striving for a goal and doing all of the unpleasant work while not feeling motivated. It's not easy but nobody ever became successful by taking the easy path. Okay, I do have to agree with that. You cannot be successful if you're always taking the easy path. There is no such critter as an easy button. No matter how many times they tell unless, you know, you're talking about chivalry and wanting to push that button, that special button that, thank God, she doesn't have access to. I hope. I hope. So, oh, wow, I only got a few minutes left. Uh, Papadopoulos, 14-day prison sentence. Wow. 14 days. Jeepers. That's a really long one. Is it going to be in one of those, um, with the tennis courts and the sauna and that kind of shit? Is that George Papadopoulos? Chloe? Not real sure. Oh, well. Y'all been listening to Grammy's Rocket Chair here on RealLibertyMedia.com, channel 10. I have my own channel now. Booyah! Thank you all for listening in on this Freaker Freaker Friday. Be sure to check back later because Grimmy and Moose Curl are going to be on with the Freaker's Ball. And that is always a good time had by all. Rarely can I stay up for much of it. I don't know if you've noticed, but there have been a few yawns during my show. I'm just a wee bit sleepy. I have been doing an awful lot of work lately and going to bed late and getting up late. Um... Hey, there you go, Grim. I could win the lottery. That's true. I could. But I got to get motivated enough to go out and buy a freaking lottery ticket. <laughs> That's the problem. Because I have to drive into town to do that. Man, is it worth it? I don't think so. So I'll just sit here and just enjoy my life the way it is. Because I really do enjoy my life the way it is anyway. So... Uh, tomorrow at noon Eastern time, be sure to be there or be square because the dorks will be there at the dork table. Vinny and Flash Rooney Dork are going to be filling you in on all of the dorkular information that there is out there and things that you just plain can't live without knowing. I'm sure that's what they're going to be sharing with you. I'm not sure if I'm going to be here or not for it. I'm going to try to, but I uh, don't. I'm not going to hold my breath. Let's just put it that way. Um, let's see. And then Sunday at noon Eastern Time, Grimmy's going to be popping in and playing some blues for you over here on RLM to uh, lead into Hal Anthony, who's going to open up a can of whoop ass on yo ass behind the woodshed. I will be back uh, next week, Wednesday for the wackadoodle wednesday edition of the rocket chair i'm trying to share this over and it's just not working it's not working i cannot talk and try and type something at the same time so let me come on over let me come over and check out you you are most welcome sock um i'm gonna go check out upi UPI is pretty much my go-to when I just have a couple minutes left. Let's see if there's another lottery person out there that's won again because I didn't go and buy a damn lottery ticket. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Oh, hey. What? 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 Okay, this is cool. Simply because I have a meme of a uh, little puppy that that the meme says, my mama was a tiger and my daddy was a very brave dog. <laughs> so from UPI.com, fearless dog chases lion away from village. 
Apparently this happened on September 5th. This fearless dog was filmed driving away a cowardly lion that wandered onto a farmer's property at the end of an Indian village. The video filmed Tuesday by the property owner uh, shows the lion wandering through the farm. The big cat comes face to face with the barking dog and pauses for a moment to stare down the smaller animal. But the brave dog lunges at the lion, causing it to flee away from the village. Such a, who's a good dog? Now we know who's a good dog. Yes, we do. Such a good puppy. <laughs> Hootie doody whatty. What's a Papadopoulos? Yeah, it sounds like a nasty pizza place, actually. Uh, oh, he was an ex-Trump advisor? Oh, good God. Dang. Dang. Papadopoulos. Say that three times fast. Papadopoulos, Papadopoulos, Papadopoulos. Yeah, that's enough of that shit. Oh, well. Y'all have an absolutely amazing rest of your evening. Thank you once again for listening in. I will try and catch up with you at the Freakers Ball. If nothing else, I'll see you sometime over the weekend or in the funny papers. Who knows? But until then, please remember, I truly do love you all. And I wish you all enough. Good night.